Hello and welcome to the Columbia Daily Tribune's Behind the Stripes webcast. This is Tribune sports editor Joe Wall Jasper along with Tribune football beat writer Dave Matter. Dave, freshly back from the desert, uh, Missouri loses 37-30 in overtime to Arizona State. Yes. Uh, let's kind of break down, first of all, James Franklin, who going into this game, I think there was a lot of question marks still about him based on how he did in the opener against Miami, Ohio. Uh, big game, he throws for more than 300 yards, uh, runs for, I think, 70-some. Uh, just your thoughts on him, and did it change your mind at all about him as the quarterback for Missouri Tigers? Definitely, because you know you look at that game and all the mistakes that Missouri made and what cost them from winning. I, I you know I don't think he's in the top ten list. I mean he he kind of carried them there mm-hmm. uh, in the fourth quarter. I, I think he was he was more than competent as a passer. Uh, you know he, he like you said he threw for three hundred yards, delivered some big time throws. Um, you know a couple that that weren't touchdowns, but probably could have been if if Marcus Lucas could have gotten in the end zone plays that ended at the one yard line or close to the goal line uh, I thought he ran pretty well against a, a, a really physical defense I mean he took a beating in that game and I, mm-hmm. I think you know that just shows a lot of toughness um, some tenacity you know he brought them down from 14 points back in, in um, early in the fourth quarter where we're sitting up there in the press box just scrambling to get stories done and it didn't really dawn on anyone that Missouri could make a comeback we just kind of buried him at that point mm-hmm. and there you go James Franklin as poised as anybody in that stadium um, a little too poised to Gary Pinkle said afterwards because you just can't notice that the kid has any um, it just doesn't seem that the, the the moment really even gets to him and that's a good thing because he, mm-hmm. he brought him right back came up short in overtime but uh, I, I don't think he's the question mark that maybe we thought he was a week ago. Now, he could still, you know, take some steps backward, but the fact that he played in that environment against a pretty good defense when things when his own defense wasn't helping him out very much, I think that's a, a real positive sign for this team. A few of the things we didn't know much about him was, A, just his ability to lead the team. He's a real happy-go-lucky guy, um, and I think some people wondered if when things went bad, if people were going to listen to him or were going to follow him. Well, if you're losing by 14 points in the fourth quarter and you bring him back to tie it and have a chance to win, I think that kind of proved he would. And I think leadership is a lot based on just on whether you're a good player or not. Right. And he proved it that game, at least in that game, he was good. It wasn't a perfect game. You know, I think, especially when you watch it on TV, they showed a few shots where there was a wide-open guy waving his arms and he's throwing it somewhere else. But played really well, I thought. And I think it was in the second quarter, the play he fumbles near the goal line, he really took a shot. And I don't yeah. think he was feeling too good the rest of the game from what he was saying at media day the other day. Like, he was having trouble breathing. Uh, he stuck with it, never uh, gave any sign he wanted to come out of the game. And so I was pretty impressed with him. And I think that's something I think a lot of people would say, that even though you lose the game, maybe you find a quarterback, which is probably true. Because I think after that Miami of Ohio game, there were some doubts about him. As, you know, is this the guy that – could be a three-year starter, or is this a guy that's just the starter because no one else is there to challenge him? Yeah, I know it'll be interesting to see how he develops from here because you know you you got to think he's more confident now because he was able to do it in that environment. He he said the one big difference for him is he was able to look downfield and yeah he missed some open receivers but he hit some guys too that mm-hmm. the week before he was kind of just staring at the pass rush and, and worried about getting sacked and and that wasn't the case against a team that blitzed you know. A lot, not 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 every down, obviously, but th- they did send a lot of pressure, and mm-hmm. and he uh, he took some shots when he was able to you know get the ball downfield. All right, late game. There was I know afterwards there was a lot of questions about Gary Pinkle's strategy as far as calling timeouts. Let's just kind of break down the late game, uh, that final drive, and what you saw that Missouri did right, wrong decision making that maybe you would have done different. Well, they started off with the ball I think at the eight yard line. Um, that's a lot of real estate to cover there in a short amount of time to uh, to take the lead there because the score was tied at that point. They got a really big run by Henry Josie, uh, I think 39 yards. Then uh, you know he probably could have cut it back and maybe gone the distance on that one. But you'll take that to get out of your own end zone. A little swing pass to Jared Culver. They're moving it there. Then they get a 10-yard run uh, by Franklin. Then Franklin gets a 5-yard run. You're in Grant Russell's territory for a field goal at that point. Um, and then things kind of got strange. They, they threw two passes. Now the first one Michael Agnew, if he catches it, the ball's at the 14-yard line. You've got a, a, a little less than a minute left to kick a, mm-hmm. for wrestles a chip-shot field goal. Um, instead, linebacker knocks the ball away, setting up third down. Then they throw it again, kind of a dangerous pass mm-hmm. for Franklin, almost gets intercepted. Even if, I think it was to West Kemp, even if he catches it, you don't really gain anything out of that a couple yards. Um, so, and, and then Gary Pinkle calls a timeout with his field goal unit on the, te- on the field. Very unconventional. I don't know if I've ever seen a team do that 
when the clock was stopped anyway. It wasn't like he was stopping the clock to you know get mm-hmm. the field goal team out there. They were already out there. But you talk to Gary afterwards, you talk to the players the last couple of days, and they tell you that that was the plan all along because of the way Arizona State, especially their linebacker, Vontaze Perfect, was jumping at the line. He was coming dangerously close to being offsides. They thought they could get him to jump offsides and get five more yards for Russell. Um, you know, if, if that plan works, and if he nudges that field goal over the uprights, then Gary Pinkle looks unconventional but looks like a genius for pulling it off mm-hmm. um, because it was such a strange move didn't work so he's obviously second guessed and I think he knew that you know he talked about it um, you know the last couple of days saying that he you know that's it's one of those calls that you're going to get second guessed on but but it was strange but it, the the players say that they talked about it at halftime they saw that Arizona State was doing that um, and, and they thought that would be kind of a counter move that they could they could maybe try one thing that I thought at the end of both halves was they had time as to work with and they sort of ignored the middle of the field and just kept trying to work the sidelines, which is where Arizona State was kind of laying in wait for them. I think if you got those timeouts, go ahead and use the middle of the field. And I think in both cases, probably could have had a better chance of getting closer so he wasn't attempting such long field goals. So I think that's more, that was the timeout management part of it I would be more concerned about then. You know, that was a calculated move by Pinkle at the end, and it didn't work, so you can always say bad. But I think I would like to see them use them more wisely during the drive itself. I, I also think sometimes that, no pun intended, they take wrestle for granted a little bit. I mean, that it's been so long that Missouri's had a really good kicker. On the road like that, it was starting to rain a little bit. The field conditions weren't great. Um, you know, he can, can he make a 48-yarder? Yeah, he can, but try to help him out a little bit more mm-hmm. with some runs that you know can pick up a few yards because at that point they were getting a pretty good chunk on, on some those Franklin runs or even Josie. So I wonder a little bit about the runs, though. Their running game is, is such, if you're getting blitzed, that that could be a six, seven-yard loss the way that, they do it. That too, and so yeah. that they almost feel safer on a pass play because at least he can throw it away where you can on the run. I don't know. That's another topic that sure. we'll be delved into, uh, the way they run their running game, especially in short yardage situations. I think that was a, maybe a bigger story in that game. Um, the defense, which I think we all assumed was going to be a real strength of this team and looked like it against Miami, Ohio, did not look like it against Arizona State. Where did you see the biggest breakdowns occurring there? Well, I, I think it all started up front. Uh, they, they did not get any semblance of a pass rush. And part of that was that uh, Brock Osweiler, the quarterback for Arizona State, who I was really impressed with, he was getting rid of the ball pretty quickly. I mean, kind of one of the staples of Dennis Erickson's offense is a three-step drop and that can neutralize a really good pass rush. But there were a lot of times where he was hanging around back there, bought some time with his feet, he even scrambled a few times, um, where you know they should have been able to get a better rush on him, whether from the front four or from the linebackers on a blitz. And I think they hit him only twice, and he threw it more than 30 times. Mm-hmm. So that, that was where everything started. That's supposed to be the strength, not only of this defense, of this entire team, was that front four. And they got pushed around up front, and you didn't even hear a few of those guys' names called all night. So that's where it starts. You can't expect any cornerback to have to cover for 10 seconds, and sometimes they did. Now, those those corners and safeties had their mistakes, too. They slipped up in, in coverage a few times. Um, you know, they got beat one-on-one, and those guys will tell you that was their fault. But it all starts up front, especially with the defense that's you know, predicated on bringing pressure uh, from the defensive line, and, and they, they failed. Mm-hmm. I would have even extend it back to the Miami, Miami Ohio game. They didn't get much heat on that guy, and that's uh, I think probably Missouri going into this season felt like they were going to be able to get pressure with their front four, so they wouldn't have to blitz mu- blitz much. Um, I know they don't really like to blitz a lot until third down, yeah. but you know I think it's almost time uh, some of these guys, you know, like Sheldon Richardson or Coney Ely, that we all thought were going to be really good. They haven't really shown up much at right. all. Sheldon basically showed up on a personal foul, and that was it. And Coney showed up on a running into the kicker, but yeah. other than that, you know, those guys haven't done much of anything so far yeah. this year. Maybe it's a matter of Missouri's offensive line in the preseason and the spring wasn't very good, mm-hmm. and that's why those guys look so good. But that's a defensive line that, that is very similar to last year's group. And last year they, they led the Big 12 in mm-hmm. sacks. This, this year they're, they're really struggling in that area, so who knows. All right, lastly we're going to get back to the realignment thing that's kind of a topic every week and is really kind of the piano hanging over the head of all the Big 12 teams. Um, it's starting to look more and more like Oklahoma just wants to go. Um, if that's the case... Oklahoma State goes with them, it would appear the Big 12 is finished. And if that's the case, what what now for Missouri? Kind of how do you think it's going to unfold? Well, you know, the SEC right now is, is saying that they're fine with 13, assuming Texas A&M gets cleared to join them. They're, they're prepared for a 13-game 
uh, season with 13 teams, but that's because the SEC doesn't want to see, be seen as responsible for blowing up the Big 12. Once it's blown up, then I think um, possibly you'll see them move in, and, and is Missouri an option for the SEC? I think, all things considered, that would be Missouri's best option. Uh, otherwise, you sit around and maybe wait for the Big 10, but that's a risk just to, just to sit there and wait. Uh, out something that may never come. The other option, I think the fallback we've discussed here is the Big East. I don't think that's an as appealing alternative uh, as the SEC would be. I mean, we've, we've discussed this a lot. The SEC is a very brutal football conference. It would be a meat grinder every week. If you thought that game against uh, Arizona State was tough, you know, get ready for something like that every week in that conference for the most part. Uh, but if that's your best alternative as opposed to waiting out the Big Ten, may never happen, or a Big East that doesn't look all that viable either, um, you know, the SEC might be your best option. Yeah, I think if it's if it does blow up, then I think if you're Missouri, um, you kind of have to gauge if the SEC is interested. If they are, I think you go to the Big Ten and give them one last chance, and if they're not ready to commit, then I don't know that you've got much choice but to go to the SEC. The Big East, you know, that's the possibility you're going to go there, and they're gonna, that whole league is going to get probably get picked apart in a year or two, too. So you're really just jumping from the fi- frying pan to the fire if you do that. And then the SEC, if nothing else, it's very stable. It's got a good TV contract. You're going to be making more money. And then it's just a matter of you just got to learn to compete, I guess, uh, if that's the way it's going to be. It's also a little bit better geographically for Missouri. So Absolutely. And I know maybe people on the academic side at Missouri aren't going to be wild about jumping in with that. I think there's only two AAU schools right. currently. Texas A&M, I think, would be the third. But... I don't know. It's just it's not going to be a lot of great options unless, I mean, I don't know what the Hail Mary pass would be for the Big 12 at this point. It, I guess if Texas wanted to stay and you wanted to add a handful of lesser schools that don't add a whole lot. But other than that, I don't. I think we may have reached the end of the line here. Yeah, that just doesn't seem very viable at this point. I think if, if that happens, I think Texas is looking out for itself and would rather go somewhere else. So um, I, I just don't see the Big 12 surviving without Oklahoma at this point. All right, well, next week we will discuss a little bit about the Western Illinois game, which is coming up this Saturday, but mainly look ahead to Missouri's visit to number one Oklahoma.